singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity One on One. As always, I will be the man with the questions and today my guest with the answers is Dr. Richard Stallman. Dr. Stallman is the founder of the free software movement. So thanks very much for having us uh, with you today, Dr. Stallman. I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. So uh, let me uh, start first of all by saying happy birthday, because if Wikipedia has this right, uh, yesterday was your birthday, wasn't it? It certainly was, and I got a wonderful uh, gesture of appreciation from the audience after my talk. Fantastic. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, so. I introduced you as the founder of the free software movement, but if someone were to ask you to introduce yourself in the best way possible in a couple of sentences, how would you do that yourself? Well, I'd start by saying that I founded the free software movement and still sort of lead it, and that I led the development of the GNU operating system, which made it possible to use a computer with only free software. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that sounds very interesting. And I know that you're very peculiar uh, on the important differentiation and distinction between the free software movement on the one hand and the open source and or proprietary movements on the other hand. Well, so, they're not movements. Okay, so can but you But I can't comp compare free software with something else until I say what it is. Absolutely. That's gotta so be the let's, first question. Let's define what the free software is and what are the common misconceptions and confusions around it. The brief definition is free software is software that respects the user's freedom and community. Making that more concrete and specific, a program is free if it gives the users the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program's source code and change it so the program does your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies of the program as you got it and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. When a program carries these four freedoms, the users have control over what it does for them. They have control both separately and collectively at once in parallel. So, this program respects the user's freedom, and this is the way computing should be. A free program is distributed in a way that is ethical because it respects freedom and community. If any of these freedoms is missing or partly missing, then the users don't fully have control over it, which means it's a non-free, proprietary, user-subjugating program the program has, the non-free program has control over the users and the owner has control over the program, which means this program is an instrument that gives the owner power over the users. That's the unjust way to distribute software. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the free software movement is we should put an end to that injustice. First, let's escape from it. And then let's help everybody else escape. Let's put an end to this wrong. Right. And to do that, we need free software to use instead. So concretely, that's most of what we do is develop free replacements mm -hmm. for proprietary software. We'd like to make it easy for you to reject proprietary software by giving you a convenient replacement. But if you value freedom, you won't wait for us to give you a perfectly convenient replacement because you'll be eager to get that non-free software out of your life. You'll be willing to make some sacrifices to keep your freedom. Freedom you should not be freedom. a matter of convenience, but of principle. Well, what I'd say is freedom is worth a sacrifice. Yes, indeed. 
indeed. And people have paid a very high price for it at different times and places and still continue to do so yes. today. That's why your work is so important. Let me... Uh, I have to confess, though, that in our field, we don't usually need to make any big sacrifices. Small sacrifices are enough. Right. So it's not so hard to do the right thing. Not in our field. Yes. Uh, it's a matter of accepting some inconvenience. I agree. And that's very important for people to understand, as well as the other common misconception that they do when you say free software, people often uh, confuse that as free as in free lunch. But actually what you mean is liber, not gratis. And you yes. mean free as freedom. Free, and, as, and in, as, is, free as in free speech, not free as in exactly. free beer. Exactly. Yes, English is confusing in this way because it doesn't have any everyday word that means free as in freedom unambiguously. So sometimes we borrow the French word libre or the Spanish word libre, yeah. which are written the same. Right. And in English, we might pronounce it libre uh, as a way of showing what we mean when we say free. So I just want to make it very clear for our audience, for the record, that you have nothing against people actually paying for software. That's right. I have nothing against selling a copy of a program. In fact, if a program is free, that gives everyone the right to make copies and sell them. And I see nothing wrong with doing that mm -hmm. because what's important is not whether you pay to get the program, but what you have once you got it, whether it respects your freedom or takes the freedom away. So I'm willing to pay for a copy of a program that if it's free, if it respects my freedom, but I wouldn't take a non-free program if they paid me. Mm -hmm. Because the price is too high. It's not just the, the, price is the, the freedom that you price, lose. But exactly, yes. And that's unacceptable. It's... It's not worth money to give up my freedom. Absolutely. Okay, so another confusion that is, is important to uh, distinguish is the difference between the operating system, the GNU operating system, and the Linux kernel. So you created or started working on the operating system since 1983, and Linux came much, much later as the final element to make it a complete package, if my yes. understanding is correct. Can you tell us a little bit about the differentiation? Because, the, of sure. course, the misconception is that it's all Linux. I'll be happy to tell you. Uh, an operating system is a collection of many programs. Nowadays, it's likely to be thousands of programs in a powerful operating system. And these programs do all sorts of things Many of them do certain specific jobs for users. Some of them are even games. And this was also the case with uh, the Unix operating system in 1983, which is what I decided to make a free replacement for. The name GNU stands for GNU's Not Unix. <laughs> it's a recursive acronym. And that was the traditional humorous way of naming a replacement for some other program. It's like a so, double tautology almost. Well, I don't know if it's double, but it's <laughs> it's meant to be fun. Programmers love recursive jokes. Yes. So the point is the operating system includes software of various different levels. The program of lowest level typically in an operating system is called the kernel. That's the program that is the base for on top of which other programs run and it allocates the machine's resources to other programs. Mm -hmm. So by 1990, we had nearly finished a minimal level of GNU operating system. Mm -hmm. The one essential component that was missing was the kernel. So we hired someone to write a kernel in 1990. But I chose a design that was perhaps too advanced and elegant, and it turned the kernel development into a sort of research project, and it took many years to get it to run at all. Mm -hmm. Some things had to be thrown away and redone, which happens in research. Yes. Uh, it would have been better to use a design that didn't require anything to be thrown away and redone, and we would have got it done faster. But 
Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for it because Torvalds liberated his kernel Linux in 1992. He started developing Linux in 1991, but in 91, it was proprietary. His license was too restrictive and didn't qualify as free software. Mm -hmm. But in 92, he re-released it under a free software license. Specifically, the license he chose was the GNU General Public License, which I wrote. Mm -hmm. But the important point is he chose a free license. And as a result, we could use Linux. It became acceptable for us on ethical criteria. So the proper way to call it is actually GNU Linux, not just Well, Linux. I'd say GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux yes. uh, to avoid ambiguity. Right. And to it's, give credit it's both to everyone. Of them. You right. see, it's, it's basically GNU, and it also contains this piece that's Linux. So it's GNU slash Linux. Um, I wouldn't call it just GNU Linux, and the reason is that's the kind of name we give to GNU components that we developed in the GNU project. For instance, I wrote an editor of the Emacs type for GNU, and that's GNU Emacs. If you said GNU Linux with a space, people would think that it's the GNU program, which is Linux, and that's not true. Torvalds wasn't part of the GNU project. He didn't write Linux for the GNU project. Mm -hmm. It just happens to work together with the GNU system, which is what we produced. Yes. So the way to give him credit and us credit is to call it GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. Yes. Now, I interviewed previously uh, 100 and other tech luminaries, uh, 190 other people on my show, and one of them was Jaron Lanier. And we discussed the free software movement with him, and his criticism was that you see, in his opinion, the free software was unable to innovate, but oh, was well, he always thinks, yes. following, and basically, in his words, copying the innovation already made in the proprietary software. Well, A, and there's nothing wrong with that. We started from zero when proprietary software already did many, many things. And just as, uh, well, basically, we had to have the things they had. Those were the most important things for us to have. But secondly... Like a steering wheel on a car. Right. The point is, we, our goal is not to advance technology. Because that's secondary compared with liberating the people subjugated by freedom trampling technology. Our goal is to give those people freedom. And what they want is free replacement. Well, they want the features they have above all. Mm -hmm. And if we can give them free replacements with the same features, even better, compatible, that will encourage them to leave the proprietary software and escape. So I decided to make the GNU system compatible with Unix to make it as easy as possible for Unix users to switch to GNU. I designed it so the programs they had written for Unix would run on GNU with hardly, with little or no change. And that was very important. That was necessary to succeed in liberating them. If we had made a system that was better in some uh, technical sense, but incompatible, and as a result, users had found it too inconvenient to switch. To migrate, yes. Well, then we wouldn't have liberated them. Mm -hmm. You see, what Lanier doesn't understand is that freedom is more important than technical progress more important than innovation. Our society puts too much emphasis on innovation as a goal, and the re this is to take for granted that innovation is good for us. Right. Well, there are certain situations where innovation is likely to be good for people, and that's where the people can freely choose which innovations to incorporate into their lives. And then they'll reject the ones that are bad, and they'll keep the ones that are good for them. And yes, once in a while, there'll be a long-term bad side effect that they won't notice, but you can't avoid that. You, you make decisions, you occasionally make mistakes. Right. But if people have control over what innovations they use, at least they can avoid the innovations that are a pain in the neck. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, that's not the case. People don't have control over this. Innovations give companies that make 
nasty products a, ch a chance to change them. And it's the companies that make sure the innovation serve the company's interests. They don't have to serve the user's interests. For instance, Apple made a big innovation with the iPhone by designing it as a jail. That is putting in censorship of applications so that the users were not free to install whatever application software they wanted, as in all previous operating systems. And no, hence it's called jailbreaking when you Right, jailbreak. exactly. <laughs> the users themselves called it a jail by using the term jailbreaking to describe when they could defeat the censorship. So uh, I just follow them in saying the machine is a jail. But the point is that was a big innovation, an innovation that was subsequently adopted by Microsoft. It's evil. Democracy was once an innovation. Tyranny was once an innovation. There's Innovations can be good or bad. And we sh make a mistake by prizing innovation so much. So as far as I'm concerned, innovation is secondary. Lanier is wrong in saying there's no innovation in free software. In fact, there's plenty of innovation in free software. If you look at the platforms that people use for developing websites nowadays, most of them are innovations that were done within the free software community. But this is less important than freedom. So previously, uh, Lanier criticized me by saying it was a waste that I decided to make a replacement for Unix when I could have just accepted Unix and built other innovative things on top of it. But that would have mean, meant no freedom at all. Unix was a non-free system. It treats its users unethically. So if I had done what he thought was better, I would have failed to solve the problem. I would have not even tried. So he just doesn't see that there's something wrong with freedom trampling software. I have to say I agree with you completely and that's why one of the common misconceptions that I have to struggle with is that people think that my blog is about technology, but actually it's not about technology. Technology is just a context. My blog is about ethics because technology in itself is amoral, but how we use it, how we apply it, where we apply it, for what purposes makes it either moral or immoral. In other words, the application makes it an ethical or not ethical tool. And well, that's I don't where quite we... agree. Well, I think in the abstract, technology is amoral and can be used in many ways. Mm -hmm. But specific technologies may be good or evil. Which is the application thereof. Yes. But even, but even more generally, it's not... Yes, any given program can be judged as, as treating people ethically or treating people unjustly. But it may be that a, in a somewhat broader way, a certain kind of technology can be seen to lead to certain kinds of effects. For instance, digital technology leads to uh, surveillance and accumulation of dossiers about people. But it doesn't have to, does it? Doesn't it doesn't have to, right. but it tends to. It's hard to push it in the direction of not doing so. I think we can if we try hard enough, but that's not the way the current tends to flow. But I don't think that's technology that tends to do that. It's the people who are well, making course, those choices. Yes and no, but the point is, Digital technology makes it easy to set up systems that surveil people. And unless there's political will to prevent that, it tends to happen. Exactly. And the and easy way is not the right way necessarily. Exactly. But my point is that given these facts that you recognize, I would say that digital technology tends to promote surveillance, not inevitably. Mm -hmm. uh, we can resist it. We can resist it sometimes individually, and if we organize, we can push it in the other direction. But it takes pushing, mm -hmm. you see. So the, it's sort of, yes, you can push something uphill, but it tends to go downhill. So a hill <laughs> tends to promote rolling down. And in this same way, digital technology tends to promote collection of data about people. And... Be because of this, I think that a given kind of technology is not always morally neutral. It can tend to be good or tend to be bad.
So let me ask you, since you use the metaphor of the hill here, then don't you feel like you're doing this kind of Sisyphean effort of pushing, rolling the stone up the hill against all odds and all sort of physics and, and the predominant No, because it doesn't roll down. It's rather that there are lots of stones and we've pushed some of them up the hill and we're holding them up there. But there are more stones, and every so often more stones are made, and they're always at the bottom of the hill when they're made. So you feel you've made progress for the last 30 years since oh, you started? Oh, definitely. If you compare where freedom was in 1984 with where it is in 2016, <laughs> we have achieved tremendous things. Pun intended or non intended? What pun? 1984. 1984 is the year when I started developing GNU. Okay, because that's also the title of George Orwell. I know, but that's coincidence. <laughs> okay, so not intended. Uh, the point is that we now have complete free operating systems. We have tens of thousands of useful free programs that do many things. And we even have computers for sale with all free software installed in them. So what's a good example? If let's say someone watches this and say, okay. But I, I didn't finish, you burst in. Okay, finish. Uh, that's a thing that journalists often do. They're too quick to burst in. They all always right. have a list of more questions and they tend to stop me from answering at length, which I do. Okay. The point is that we have advanced tremendously and yet there are newer areas where things are totally bad, like the software in cars and the software in mobile devices, uh, the software in medical devices. John Deere tractors. Yeah. So the point is, uh, we certainly can solve problems and we have done so. We have made great advances and yet there are tremendous areas which have yet to be liberated and their number seems to be increasing. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, before we move on to the other details, like the examples of the free computers, let me ask you about this, because if your movement is about freedom, isn't then that not a mere technical movement? It's not even a mere philosophical movement. It's a political movement in a Absolutely. way. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about that. Where's the politics in it, the way you see I'm it? Sorry. The idea that software should be free, that we deserve control over our computing, is the political idea. It is a political idea in the same way that freedom of expression is a political idea. And you can campaign for one just as you can campaign for the other. Now, this does not have to be linked to any uh, overarching, broad political ideology. And in, in our case, it's not. There are, uh, there are a lot of uh, libertarians, that is, sort of right-wing anarchists who uh, support the free software movement. Mm -hmm. We accept their support. I don't agree with them in general, but they're... The free software movement doesn't take a position on the other issues. And yet the, it seems to me that the free software movement is this interesting mixture of ideas of, on the one hand, capitalism, on the other hand, socialism, and on the other hand, anarchism, a little Three bit hands. of all. Isn't yes. that correct? Yes. Uh, the, there's an idea of capitalism because we encourage people to make money as long as they do it by treating others ethically. We condemn certain business practices that deny freedom to others and subjugate them. But that doesn't mean we condemn business as such. There are free software companies which are acting ethically and we say we, we wish them healthy profits and we'd like <laughs> to see more people follow that path. And we certainly don't want to eliminate private business. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we also see businesses that are very powerful and subjugate people and they shouldn't exist. They should disappear. Uh, there are socialist ideas. For instance, the idea that the knowledge incorporated and embodied in software should be available to humanity. Right. Should be available to humanity. Right. It should be part of human knowledge. Uh, and so shared, to be shared. 
Well, but for people to be free to share, yes, right? They're also free to sell copies, but they're free to share. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a socialist idea that the software should be in some sense humanity's software. Common good. Not, yeah. Uh, and so we have, when in the GNU project, our development of software we see as a way of contributing to the good of humanity, mm -hmm. not a way of gaining advantage over others. But on the other hand, we won't reject the free software that's developed by companies. If it respects our freedom, then it's treating us ethically so we can accept it and use it and distribute it. And the then there's the anarchist idea, which is that you should be free to do what you want with the software free by yourself. Now, you shouldn't, we don't advocate allowing you to subjugate others by making it proprietary. But when you do things with the software yourself, you should be free to do whatever you like. Mm -hmm. And in, to be free software, it's got to give you that freedom to do whatever you like by yourself. So if you were to imagine the best possible fulfillment of all your ideas. What's that dream look like for you? What's that? Is there like sort of the ideal, if we, if it's possible at all, to have the ideal platonic outcome for you? It would that you're be aiming to all software is free. Companies that include that distribute software or in, put it inside a product publish the source code and the user is free to run a changed version. And how far, or how close do you think we are? We still have a long way to go towards that. But on a logarithmic scale, I'd say we've <laughs> gone around halfway. Halfway. Very interesting. So that's not very far on a logarithmic scale. Well, no, it's halfway. But the point is, and in absolute quantities, it's a small fraction of the users. But I think the difficulty is measured better by the logarithmic scale. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me ask you about, and you touched a tiny little bit about this, but let me ask you about the importance of reverse engineering, which is kind of a cotangent topic of related to sharing, right? So tell us a little bit more about why you think reverse engineering is so important. Well, maybe I should start by saying what it means. Okay, excellent. It means studying some device to figure out how it works. The specific case where we need reverse engineering is when they sell hardware and refuse to tell you how to use it. Mm -hmm. So we can't develop free software to run that hardware while the specs are unknown to us. We need to find out the specs and the way you do that is re reverse engineering. There are various different methods that you could use to figure out the specs of the hardware device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And occasionally we succeed in persuading the company to release the specs, and that's good. Uh, that's easier than reverse engineering when it works. But it may be impossible in any given case. Often it's impossible, whereas reverse engineering can be done. Now, going back to the free computer, you mentioned that once. So tell me what's the best path that you would recommend, mm. perhaps, to users? Uh, who are interested to either liberate their current computers or to get another one which has been free from the get-go. What, what's the path that you recommend? Well, what I recommend now is to look at fsf.org slash resources and see the products that we've endorsed. Uh, they're not newly made computers. They're used, but some of them are not very old. Mm -hmm. And they're being... Uh, loaded with free software and resold. Mm -hmm. They're rather cheap compared with new computers in many cases. They're not quite as powerful, but you don't need such a powerful computer. It's hard to, it's hard to find anything one wants to do with a computer that needs the full power of today's computers, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the major questions given my audience is what's Dr. Stallman's take on the artificial intelligence uh, progress and the, the issues related to the technological singularity in general? Well, the technological singularity is 
a very interesting science fiction scenario. And uh, I really loved uh, Marooned in Real Time. Bernard uh, Inge's book? Yeah, which talked about a technological singularity. So something you, that was basically incomprehensible. When they figured out that that's what had happened and we, why humanity wasn't there on Earth anymore, they, had no, they couldn't tell what had actually happened to humanity. They just figured out that this was why something had happened and why they returned and, and found nobody. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> you know? we don't know whether that's going to happen. We don't know whether it's possible. It's a speculation, and that's all. It is likely that powerful AIs will be made that are uh, that can make plans for things better than a human can. Then the next question is, will they be autonomous or will they be working for some human or group of humans, well, like a company? You see, uh, just because AIs are under human control doesn't mean they're safe for humans. They might be under the control of this group of humans, which might be Google or IBM, and that doesn't mean they're safe for the other humans. Remember, the, uh, the uh, billionaires that want to broil the Earth's ecosphere are very powerful and they may very well succeed in doing it. They can kill billions of people. They can destroy technical civilization. So, uh, you know, just because things are under the control of some humans doesn't make them safe. There's always the question of which humans have and the control right, of that. I agree with that. And we can observe that today, even with the drone killings, uh, you know, those drones are yeah, being controlled those by are not humans. AI. Yeah. But, well, they have a lot of AI, not uh, artificial general intelligence, but artificial narrow intelligence per se, which is very good for what they're designed for. And oh. they're still designed to kill people, which they do very yes. effectively, <laughs> arguably. Yeah. Uh, but, but the bigger question though is this, uh, you, by the way, your assessment of the singularity is almost verbatim the same as Dr. Noam Chomsky, uh, who on my show said the singularity is science fiction. And yet there's many other people, uh, like for example, Ray Kurzweil, who have given a number of specific benchmarks, starting for I'm example- I'm not impressed from, by any kind of argument like so that. So for example, yesterday, or, go, uh, the Go champion of Korea got defeated at the final the world. game yes, of Go. Yes, I know. Uh, but That's not impressive to you? It is impressive, but it that doesn't and and but that doesn't prove that a superhuman general intelligence will exist. It may, and but even if a superhuman general intelligence exists, that doesn't prove there will be a singularity. We just don't know. Well, it, it's I, I'm just skeptical of anyone who tries to predict the future like that, except in the presence of a specific mathematical model with reasons to believe that it actually shows us what's going to happen. Well, and no one has that. We've never been through that terrain before. We don't know what will happen. Let's just recognize we don't know. Well, don't you accept uh, Moore's, Moore's law as, as a sort of a logarithmic model of well, the that's last 40 or 50 years? Well, that's about to end, isn't it? Well, there's uh, a lot of debate on that. And I mean, Ray Kurzweil argues that before, you know, we had microprocessors and chips, we had uh, vacuum tubes, and before that we had punch cards and, and all kinds of other machines. And well, there he were argues relays. that, yeah. uh, yes, with relay systems and stuff, he argues that what he calls the law of accelerating returns has been basically around since the 1890s census, um, and then Moore's law is just the latest I'm just version not, I, of it. I'm not interested in this kind of argument. I won't be persuaded by it mm -hmm. that anybody actually knows. Uh, it's These are all speculative kinds of arguments. They're not physical models. They're not, they're not based on equations based on physical knowledge. Right. So they're... I agree. Educated guesswork. Right. And I won't treat them as more than that. I don't know whether there will be a technological singularity. Right. I expect I will be destroyed if I'm still alive. <laughs> if one happens, I find it a very scary thing. Oh, I see. But I, I don't expect to live to the point where that would happen if mm -hmm. it happened. 
Well, some people argue that it's going to happen in the next two or three decades. Werner Vinge being one well, of them. Even if it happens in three decades, I don't expect to be alive. In three decades? Yes, I'm 63 now. Most people, I think, don't live to be 93. And if I do live to be 93, I may be, uh, I may be mentally dead or who knows what. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, you may live to see those things. I probably won't. Well, I sure hope so, but it's unpredictable, as you said. That's not a mathematical But in any law. case, unless, unless people are very careful, I think a singularity is likely to destroy uh, most of humanity. And That's uh, what Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Steve Wozniak and a number of other people have well, been concerned about yes, lately. Right. Uh, but it's... But I don't know a way to avoid that. I don't know if there is any way to avoid that, but I wouldn't be able to tell what it is because again, it, we're so far away from it that all we could do is speculate. Or so close. Many people who work in the field that I've interviewed claim that we may be you know, one Sputnik moment away from the artificial intelligence because... Well, if we are, then it will almost certainly be devastating. Because arriving at uh, superhuman general intelligence in an unplanned way means basically you throw the dice and see if humanity survives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to throw the dice. I don't want to throw those dice. But I, you see, I, I'm scared of the AI that we have today, I which is not superhuman and does not threaten to take control over hum away from humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it does give some humans power over other humans, and that, of course, is very dangerous. For instance, look at voice recognition servers. Right. Uh, such as Siri. Yes. Well, they work by transmitting people's voice to, to a server, mm -hmm. and the server changes the voice into text And the server can snoop on everybody who's using this. So you shouldn't use it. I would never use a thing like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very careful what I ever use a server for. But you have to realize if you are using it that a company's listening to you all the time. And Big Brother can listen whenever he feels like it. And to me, that's what that's such a powerful reason to re reject it that I would never consider using it. Those are all very good points, but in a way, let me ask you this. Don't you think that all progress made by humanity since the time we left the caves has been in a way throwing the dice? I mean, crossing yes, the Bering Sea and The question is, how much is, our, how much is at stake when you throw the dice? Well, it's always the same at stake, our lives. Like, with the people who crossed over the Bering Sea into North America and no. went all the way down no, south. You, no, it's not the same. They were risking they their own, lives. They risked their own lives, but not the lives of anyone else. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, so nowadays, there are things that a few people can do that risk everyone's lives. Yes. And humanity is doing lots of really stupid, dangerous things, like feeding antibiotics to farm animals Agreed. en masse. Uh, that's killing people. Uh, it's totally stupid. And once again, it shows the, uh, the way our political system has been corrupted Uh, by the power of, of business. So you, and you can see this again and again and again in, in so many different fields. Uh, global heating and the danger of global calamity uh, is the biggest single one. Mm -hmm. But uh, throwing away the benefit of antibiotics is another. And that, that wouldn't kill everybody, you know. Uh, even when there were no antibiotics, diseases didn't kill everybody in general. Uh, they did kill millions, but yes, yes. they did. But they they wouldn't wipe out civilization. Right. But they could kill a lot of people. Right. The But, point is, whereas uh, global heating could wipe out civilization, 
yes. and could uh, there would still be a few people alive, I suppose. I don't think the end of si technical civilization would kill every human being. Right. Human beings can live in so many different circumstances. We can go, go back to the Stone Age, basically. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree with you. Uh, let, me, let me move forward our conversation to another term, uh, which also comes through a question from Luke Parrish. But uh, the general question is, what's your take on transhumanism? And the more specific question from Luke is, is the hacker community inherently transhumanist in some sense? What goals or features do, do, may they have in common? Well, clearly they're not the same. Uh, Hacking is playful cleverness. To be, the hacker community is a community of people who enjoy playful cleverness. They enjoy doing it. They enjoy showing it off. They enjoy seeing it. They're impressed by it. And uh, those are all things today we observe in biohackers. Yes. The point is that uh, you don't have to be have any particular views to share this aesthetic, you might say, this predilection for playful cleverness. So they don't have to be transhumanists. They don't have to not be transhumanists. They don't have to be in favor of or against anything except hacking. If they're against hacking, they won't, they won't be hackers. But in a way, hacking is about improving. It's about creating something new, isn't it? Yes, well, and that's what yes and no, yes and no. Because hacks can be just clever and impressive. They don't have to build something that's useful, although many of them do. Same with transhumanism. Sometimes people do stuff just to be clever and impressive and good or or well transhumanism as I understand as it is aiming for something that doesn't exist yet, which is to be augmented beyond Not necessarily. That's probably the exists. later stages of what's called sometimes posthumanism, but transhumanism could be anything, including uh, the smallest ways of overcoming the limitations of our biology. So, for example, the fact that we're wearing clothes or the fact that I wear contact lenses and we use any kind of technology and we're not in the caves uh, is in a way I'm sorry. overcoming that stretches, our limitations. That stretches the word transhumanism to the point where it becomes useless, where it's no different from There's been that having technology. Yes. Yes. Uh, the word is only useful if it is narrower and thus different yes. from having technology. Right. And indeed, I don't know if there have ever been human beings without technology since uh, there have been fire for a while. Yes. Well, no, fire right. is technology, Absolutely. and fire was first controlled by ancestors of a different species. And then there were stone tools, which were made by various different species of our ancestors going back millions of years. Right. So, uh, no, there were never human beings without technology. Uh, so don't say, I, I would say it's, it would be more appropriate to say that using technology is humanism rather than to call it transhumanism. Transhumanism has got to be something, uh, further away uh, and it's a we don't we, there's no point exactly arguing about what it is right but uh, i would say that if you're going to do hacking with technology you must like technology at least to some extent you would if you if you hated computers you wouldn't play with them so today's biohackers for example who implant magnets in their fingers or all kinds of other microchips to open doors or whatever they kind of uh, enhance the capabilities of their biology. And in some cases, like for example, with the Agnes, it gives them supposedly another sense, another way of perceiving the environment mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. And that's going beyond their yes, it, well, biological when, limitations. Well, in that field, you can, you can do hacking, but not all work at any given field is hacking. Yes. See, hacking is playful cleverness, but uh, research isn't necessarily playful. It can be good research without being playful. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't equate uh, research or technological progress with hacking. But okay. some people who make that progress are hacking. Okay, fair uh, enough. So l let me throw in a few other uh, audience questions that I think can be interesting. So. Uh, David Roscheck asks, how does the rise of fully free hardware, like the Novena laptop, 
change the equation for free software going forward. Okay, I have to explain that I wouldn't call the Novena fully free hardware. Please because do, it's yeah. made with commercial chips whose designs are secret. Oh, I see. They're not they're not they're not even published as proprietary. They're just not published at all. They're they're built into silicon. Uh, on the other hand, the circuit board level of the design is free, and that's a good advance compared with other computer designs that we see around us. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't necessarily change anything as regards free software, and the reason is there is stuff in at least one of the chips that can't be used with free programs. Those are, they're in the system on a chip, which is the center, basically the computer part, as mm -hmm. a, well, uh, it even has some memory in it, I believe. Uh, it also has a, uh, a graphics coprocessor and a video coprocessor, and these both require non-free software to function at all, mm -hmm. although work is being done on the graphics coprocessor of reverse engineering to, to get free software that can do it. The point is that, um, as you see, the fact that the circuit board is free doesn't solve the problem that the chip poses for the software. It has to be the full system, and this one is not. Yeah. Well, it, yes but and no, because, but, but listen, you can do a lot with that machine without those coprocessors. I'm sure I'd be perfectly happy with that machine with the coprocessors in a non-functioning state. So I would have only free software, and I'd find it a perfectly satisfying computer, I guess, mm -hmm. assuming that the other practical things like the size of the screen are, are sufficient and it had a good keyboard that was good to type on and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Another question from David is this, does Snowden revelation revelations proved you prophetic on, on your warnings about the risks of trusting security to proprietary vendors. So now what do we do, he asks. We have these computing infrastructures on our desktop and in our pocket, which are undermined. And if we want security, what do we do to move forward and how do we do well, it? Well, first of all, uh, free software is the only possible basis for computer security because a proprietary program gives zero security against its developer. Now this is something that people often ignore. They ask about computer security and implicitly they mean, they assume it means security against third parties. They don't ask does Windows give me any security against Microsoft? Well, the answer is zero. It gives zero security against what Microsoft. What about the current ongoing dispute between Apple versus FBI? Any Apple operating system gives you zero security against Apple because only Apple could change the software and there are malicious functionalities in Apple operating systems. So, uh, and not only that, part of the malicious functionality is the fact that the i things are designed so that the only software that they will run is Apple's. They won't even let the user install a modified program. And as a result, the user is forced to put all trust in Apple. That's why it matters so much whether Apple can resist the FBI's demands. In the free world, we wouldn't have the issue. In the free world, yeah, of course, if you've got the computer physically, you can install some other software in it. But that doesn't enable you to break the disk encryption because what keeps the disk encryption secure is a long passphrase that they couldn't possibly brute force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, on the desktop front, we have the GNU slash Linux uh, option, but on the mobile front, there doesn't seem to be any good solutions currently. Even yeah, here's what the problem is. It's hardware with secret specifications. Uh, a mobile phone or even a tablet has many peripherals inside it. 
and they have secret specs and we don't know how to run them. It's a giant reverse engineering job that's needed. There is a free operating system that will run some mobile phones. What it can do is calls and texts. It's well, called Replicant. It's a modified version of Android with the non-free stuff removed. Now, we would like it to be able to do other things like take photos, but for that, we need uh, to reverse engineer the interface of the camera. Right. That's the only level of it that's hard. And that's all proprietary software currently. With it's not just prop proprietary software, it's, it's secret, secret specs yeah. of the hardware. Right. We, could re we can replace proprietary software, we're good at that. Figuring out the specs of the cameras, that's what's hard. Richard, do you think that governments should mandate free software for their own use? And has free software become a clear national security concern based on everything that you just said? The government does its computing for the people. The government exists for the people. In theory, at least. Well, it's supposed to. If, if yes. it doesn't, then it's not a legitimate government and uh, one might hope it gets replaced through regime change. But the point is that <clears throat> you and I, we exist for ourselves, fundamentally. We should care about others, but each human being is a source of value. Each human being deserves things. And so if you lose control of your computing, that's bad for you, directly bad for you. So my first reaction is to say, oh, what a shame. I hope you recover the control of your computing and the way you do that is to stop using the non-free software. Mm -hmm. But f first and foremost, you're the victim in that scenario. Now, if you're using programs that have a network effect, such as, for instance, Skype, uh, then you're pressuring other people to use them. So you're a culprit, a perpetrator, as well as the victim. I'm interviewing Jan Talon two weeks from now, so I'm going to raise that point with him. Okay, I don't know that name, but that doesn't he, matter. Well, he doesn't have anything to do with Skype, but he was the founder and he eventually sold it. Okay, I, I don't, but, okay, so yeah, he's one of many people who did something that was unjust. And uh, in any case, because it's proprietary software, it's unjust. The point is, that when people use non-free software, the people are the victims. They're being uh, pushed, they're being uh, subjugated by the power of the software owner. However, when the government loses control of the computing, which it does for the people, then the government is not the victim. The government is irresponsible in that case because it has a duty to the people to maintain control of the computing it does for the people. It's at if least it, complicit, you're saying. Right, it's, it is irresponsible. Yes. I, I wouldn't use the word complicit, although of course the government got that software through intentional decisions, but the point is irresponsible is a better word. Okay. Uh, the government had a responsibility to maintain control of its computing. It failed to carry out that responsibility. So it has, it has made bad decisions that are continuing to do harm. Mm -hmm. And it has to change those policies. It's got to, it has a duty, a responsibility to the people to get rid of that non-free software and switch to free software. Whereas I wouldn't say you have a responsibility to switch to free software, or at least not a responsibility to the people. You have a responsibility to yourself. To myself, yes. But in the case of public agencies, it's a responsibility to the people. They're doing wrong by using non-free software. Yes. In gnu.org slash philosophy slash governmentfreesoftware.html, we have a list of proposed government policies mm -hmm. designed to move the government uh, at a steady pace towards free software. Mm -hmm. Because it's such a big job that I wouldn't expect the government to be able to do this in a year. 
But the point is to keep it moving to systematically move the state towards free software. Indeed. And even that's, that takes political will expressed in concrete policies. Yes, yes, very much so. But uh, a member of my audience calling himself a friendly hacker asks more to this point the following questions. How do you deal with the paradox of what users want versus what we think they need? Uh, in other words, that's the Henry Ford faster horse problem. So perhaps we think that they want freedom or they no, need I don't, freedom. No, I'm not talking about whether they want freedom. I'm not concerned with what users actually want because I'm not tra- aiming to please them nor for success in the usual sense. I'm not aiming to make software that will be popular. I'm aiming to give users freedom. And if they don't understand their need for freedom, that has no influence on me. I'm not going to try to give them what they want instead of freedom. I'm going to work to give them freedom. I can't make them take it, but that's what I'm going to give them. In other words, that's your personal commitment. Right. Okay, I respect that very much. Excellent. So. Another question uh, is coming from uh, Corey Kowal, who says, ask uh, Dr. Stallman if self-replicating machine designs and human-designed living things should be free. Make sure he clarifies if he means free as in money or free as in labor. Um, So self-reproducing machine designs. Well, I think in general, machine designs should be free just as all works that are made to be used in a practical way should be free. And this doesn't mean they all have to be published. Mm -hmm. Free software doesn't have to be published. If you write a program and use it yourself, that's free software because all the users have the four freedoms. All one of the users in this case have the four freedoms. It's a trivial case of free software. So free software or free machine designs or whatever, it doesn't mean they all have to be published. It doesn't mean they must be accessible to you. So should in, let's say, for example, I have a full genome sequence of my genome. Should I keep this secret and proprietary because it's my own? I'm not talking about... Well, wait, secret is not the same as proprietary. Well... Uh, I'm asking you to maybe talk about each of I those think on it, their own and right, where should we right, draw the okay. line. Basically, I don't think you have any obligation to public to publish your DNA sequence. And it might be wise not to. Exactly. In fact, it might be wise not to have it sequenced at all. Well, uh, for example, I may have some health concerns. You might, but the chances at this point that they could tell you about some in a in a useful way are pretty small. I would disagree and, with you on that. Uh, and you never know what some insurance company will do to you. I agree with you on uh, that. You live in Canada. Yes. Maybe you don't have to worry about that. In the U.S., uh, with a much worse medical system, people Indeed. have to worry about that. Yes, that, 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 that's a fair um, point. But And when it comes to artificial design life forms, um, I'd say that's, again, like the issue of the machine designs. There's no obligation to publish them, but they should be free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. Although, with the current level of biotechnology, as far as I know, we're still not at the level where we can build large systems designed from zero. We take these large systems and we add a little bit to them, the large systems that exist because they evolved in nature. And then we add a little bit to them and that's what our capabilities are right now, but maybe our capabilities will be more in the future. Right, I mean, we went from the Wright brothers in 1903 to the moon in like 60 some years. So, uh, I agree with you. Maybe right now we're very shortly after the Wright brothers moment in biotech, mm-hmm. but I think we're making very impressive progress. Yeah. And now, one reason, I, one reason I'm not confident the progress will be so fast is that uh, the Wright brothers airplane was pretty simple. And even the DC-3 was not that complicated. Uh, whereas the natural living things that were living species that we're starting with 
are tremendously complicated. There's a lot of redundancy and archiving in the genes. It doesn't matter because it's only somewhat redundancy, you see. Uh, again, from a member of my audience, and it is, is software free when code becomes so large and complex that no single person can understand it, even yes. as an expert? Well, yes, because free software is about whether the users have control. Now, if the body of code is so big, which the GNU slash Linux system already is, too big for any one person to understand it all, that doesn't mean you don't have control. You can learn the part you want to change. And not only that, you can work with others. That's how the community develops the system now. Uh, there are various groups working on the various parts. And some parts basically just sit there because nobody's working on them now. And if you want to work on any of these parts, you're free to do so. So you're not personally exercising total control, but at least you can exercise control over any part if you want to, and you're part of larger groups that are exercising control. Collectively. Over, yeah, collective control over various parts. Mm -hmm. And you're not subjugated by someone else. You see, with a proprietary program, even if it isn't so big, even if it's easy for one programmer to understand it all, you as a user are not allowed to understand it or have any control over any part of it. Indeed, yes. So this is, uh, I think that the person who posed that question hasn't separated the political issue that a proprietary program gives one entity power over the users mm -hmm. from the uh, difficulty of, of working on software, which is just the way it is and it's not anybody's fault. Mm -hmm. What's the best place for people to follow you and your work? Well, uh, they can uh, subscribe to the Free Software Foundation's monthly announcement list at fsf.org. Of course, you can also become a member of the FSF. I'm a full-time volunteer for the FSF, but there are paid staff and mostly the way we get the money to pay them is from our members and from donations. But if you want to participate, look at gnu.org slash help for a list of various ways to participate. Excellent. And if you want to install the system, look at gnu.org slash distros. Fantastic. And then the last question I always ask of my guests is this. Today we covered a wide variety of topics with you for the past one hour. What's the sort of final message you want to send us with? How, what's the best way to wrap up our conversation? What's kind of the most important thing you want us to take from this conversation with you? Freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you have to be ready to struggle to defend it and freedom is threatened globally now. Plutocratic regimes are trying to impose treaties like the TPP, TPP yes. treacherous plutocratic poison, <laughs> and the TTIP, which is this treaty is plutocratic, and then there is okay. CETA, which is a, a monster of the Atlantic, and all sorts of uh, of injustices will be imposed by those treaties if they get adopted. We've got to campaign now to defeat those treaties, to save our countries from being subjected to additional power from plutocrats. In the U.S., uh, support work for the Sanders campaign. Uh, he can still win, uh, but you better work for him now Dr. Richard Stallman, thank you very much for being with us today. Happy hacking. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you guys enjoyed this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation.